Welcome back to the Speaking and Communicating Podcast. I am your host, Roberta Tandlela. If you are looking to improve your communication skills, both professionally and personally, this is the podcast you should be tuning into. Communication skills are crucial for your career growth and leadership development. The Speaking and Communicating Podcast is part of the B Podcast Network. And to learn more about the Bee Podcast Network, go to bpodcastnetwork.com. We focus so much on communication skills, and most of the time we talk about the workplace communication skills. But my guest today, neurosurgeon and professor at Virginia Tech, Dr. Gary Simmons, hailing all the way from North Carolina, is here to talk to us about how he communicates with patients especially during traumatic experiences and their families as well. And before I go any further, please help me welcome him to the show. Hi, Dr. Gary. Hi, uh, thank you so much for having me. It's, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure. Thank you for being here. Welcome to the show. How is North Carolina? Uh, it is gorgeous right now. We're in the mountains and the leaves are beginning to turn. Oh, hello, fall. Now yeah. tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, I, uh, I had practiced neurosurgery for several decades uh, and was a very active surgeon, but also had a leadership role in that I was the uh, chief of a uh, neurosurgery program at Virginia Tech up, up in Roanoke, Virginia. And this is a teaching program, meaning we we train residents uh, as well as obviously uh, take care of all the patients that come in. Um, so uh, very much involved in uh, teaching as well as the surgery. Uh, but I did retire from surgery a few years ago. And since that time, I've been principally teaching uh, both medical students and undergrads at Virginia Tech, as well as writing books. Mm. And then how did you get started? Is this something you always wanted to do as a child, to touch human brains? <laughs> uh, no, it's, uh, it's, uh, I guess it's a little bit of a strange story. Although once you get to know um, medical students, I don't think it's that unusual in that I entered medical school thinking that I'd be a family doctor. And I went through several other permutations uh, and eventually ended up as I was going to go into cardiothoracic surgery, meaning, you know, be a heart surgeon uh, and had it all lined up and was, you know, just about to leave medical school when I saw my first brain operation. And I just went, oh, my God, I've I've got to do that. Uh, so, I, you know, at the last second, I'm running around trying to uh, switch horses in midstream, if you would. And um, uh, that was a bit of a challenge. And I frankly had no idea what I was getting myself into, uh, but it worked out uh, fortuitously for me because uh, I ended up loving it. I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Mm. And when you go to medical school and you're going to be a brain surgeon, I'm guessing you also learn the science behind how we communicate with the brain and everything related to communication in the brain. Sure. I mean, it's uh, the training for neurosurgery uh, is at least seven years after medical school. So after you graduate from med medical school, you go into training for seven years. And obviously, a lot of that time's dedicated to learning surgical techniques. But we're expected to know uh, everything there is to know about the brain, if you will. You kind of know it back to front. So you kind of start very much uh, in what we would call the basic sciences, learning the anatomy, the physiology, how it all works, and then how it all starts to break down and get diseased and then what to do about it. So yeah, you, we spend a lot of time learning about that. Communications is a huge part. We, When we operate in the brain, you know, one of our biggest concerns is causing damage that may mess up some of our principal functions. Obviously, we always think about movement uh, and that sort of thing, but very much we're acutely aware of uh, in any way damaging communication skills, uh, particularly speech, obviously. 
Mm, mm. And when us regular folks do these affirmations or we're trying to change our behaviors, does the science you learned, does it support that, that it can bring about the change eventually if we reprogram our brains? Yes, I, I would say it absolutely does. I think it's a very interesting question. And certainly on, on one level, I, I very much endorse it because I've worked a lot in the world of burnout and building resilience and wellness. And that's, I mean, that's one of our principal goals is to do exactly what you're saying. But um, I think it's very interesting when you, when you think about the brain. I, I think a lot of people kind of see the brain as like a computer, that there's a whole bunch of wires and they're all connected in fancy ways. And somehow you're able to do, you know, pretty magnificent things with those wires. But but that they're kind of all set up, they're all built, you know, in the factory, and that's the way they are forever. That's how a computer works. And and if you need your computer to be able to do new things or different things, you may have to get a new computer at some point, you know, that, that wiring is just not going to do. But the brain is not like that. It is not static. Yes, it is a lot of wires. It's a lot more wires than, than the computers. Um, and, and each of these wires, each of the cells, the neurons, the nerve cells, they communicate with thousands of other cells. And so there, there are billions of nerve cells and there are quadrillions of connections between the nerve cells. But those connections are not hardwired, if you will. They change all the time. Uh, they change on multiple levels, whether, uh, whether you make the connection or not, whether you keep that connection, how strong you make that connection. It's, it's down to the chemical level uh, where, where uh, one cell communicates with another through releasing chemicals that we call neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin, stuff that we've all heard of. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to have what's called receptors that receive those chemicals. And then that influences the next nerve cell. Um, and those receptors, you can, you can put out more, you can put out less, you can shut it down, uh, you can modify them. And uh, so the system is constantly changing, constantly adapting. And it's very much got to do with what you're firing through it which channels you're using, which networks you're using. And the more you use them, the more strong they become. The, the less you use them, the more you lose them. Uh, so very much, I would 100% support uh, that concept that the more we reinforce these things, the better they work. So we can rechannel. We absolutely can rechannel. And there's really good scientific evidence of that. Mm. So the refiring, it sounds like a very, uh, there's, there's just a lot going on in the yes. brain, all the neurons firing. Is it necessary and is there a way to sometimes calm it down all the firing or is it it's just something that we have no control over? I think, um, yeah, yeah, on a number of on a number of levels, um, it is always going. And, you know, the only way you're ever going to make it not go uh, would be through some sort of uh, chemical manipulation, like general anesthesia. So, you know, if, if we hit it with a strong anesthetic, we can actually make it kind of flatline, like on an EEG where, where not much is going on. Otherwise, there is always stuff going on, communications back and forth, uh, all across the brain. However, the brain goes through various cycles of activity and excitement and that sort of thing. Uh, and so we can definitely calm it. Um, you know, we certainly do through certain phases of sleep, but we can kind of mimic a lot of that. Uh, well, at least some people, I'm not good at it, but, but you know, through something like meditation mm. and just, you know, just kind of really calming down all the stimuli that are coming into it uh and we can definitely uh we can definitely settle it down if you will right when you help your clients with stress burnout is 
some of the root causes of that, the constant firing, or is there more? I think that's a great question. I, I when in so we we wrote three books on this. It was it was all kind of oriented to medical personnel, although I think it's pretty universal. Um, but I think um, in, in the books we we listed I don't know seventy eighty of the common stressors that that we're all subjected to at, at one level or another. Uh, but certainly a big one, and I think in modern in modern life. Uh, is the concept of multitasking, if you will? You know, we're con we're all very overrated. Actually, I, I usually say to people, "Don't count me under multitaskers. I do one thing at a time." <laughs> well, and the and there's a strong, you know, there's strong uh, neuroscience behind that too. Even though the brain's working on things all the time, mm. you yourself, it is very hard to focus on more than one thing at a time. So you know, you orient all your all your uh, neurological power to the task at hand if you will so what do we do we throw a million things at at ourselves all the time so the phone is going the texts are coming in instant message emails you know all that somebody's talking to you about this somebody's talking to you about that you're thinking about all the other things you have to accomplish so yeah we are bombarding our systems you know with demands all the time Mm. And then when you help your clients with these conditions, stress, burnout, when they come to you, first of all, what does that feel like? What do they say they, they are feeling and they need help with? Well, I think um, in, in the burnout sphere, I, my favorite um, analogy or metaphor right now for burnout is the idea that we uh, all of us uh, kind of carry within us a bank of energy, if you will. You know, we have a certain amount of energy. You could call it psychic energy or most emotional energy or call it whatever you want um, that, you know, we use to get up and interact with other people and go to work and go play volleyball or, you know, all the things that we do in a day. Um, it takes a certain amount of drive, a certain amount of energy uh, and and in the same note, everything we do, every experience, every person we encounter, everything we watch, everything we hear about is either making a deposit in that bank, giving us more energy, or it's making a withdrawal. And, you know, you can you can think of many things that are making withdrawals on your on your energy banks uh, that, uh, you know, can really empty you when you think about it. Um, and so uh, to me, I think a good analogy is that you have withdrawn so much that you are just grossly overdrawn um, and you are just so low on energy that even the things that normally bring you pleasure, bring you excitement, bring you fulfillment, they're just not making a dent. You just feel like every step you're walking in concrete that uh, getting out of bed is a massive chore, that doing the things that you just normally would do without thinking have become huge chores. And by the time we get to that stage, do we, do we ignore the signs at first? Or do we feel like I can just power through this? I've, I've always done this. I can just power through every day. Yeah, I I'd say... That that's just a great question. And I, I think that's, you know, again, in modern society, that's almost what we've, you know, been taught we have to do is you know, just lower your head and drive and keep going and keep going, push, 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 ignore the pain, uh, focus on other things, focus on other people, focus on the job at hand, focus on whatever, but never focus on yourself. And in fact, I think we even take it steps beyond that. I, I We see it a lot in medicine, but I think it happens everywhere where it's almost like we, we adopt a, a, this suffering contest where we're just suffering and we're going to out suffer the person next to us. You know, they oh say that they got in at 630 in the morning, you know, all last week. And you said, yeah, well, you know, the week before I was coming in at six and, <laughs> you know, I'm the first car in and the last car out. And we, we just love to trump each other with how much suffering we go through. Uh, so that would be the antithesis of what we want to see uh, when we're trying to build wellness and resilience. 
Mm. And when we feel so burned out, what's going on with our neurological system? A uh, great question. And, and to be honest, there is not huge neuroscience um, um, underpinning right now in the burnout field. There is some evidence. It's It resembles uh, potentially what we see in high stress uh, situations and um, even depression where there, there is changes in the actual architecture of neurons uh, and in various areas of the brain, areas like uh, what we call the, the limbic system, the hippocampus, the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, um, all these areas of the brain that are normally involved in you know, our, our energies, our reward systems, our, our being able to get pleasure out of things, happiness, that sort of thing, as well as fear and, and agitation and that sort of thing. Well, anyway, these, these networks actually do undergo change. There are certain areas where um, the, the parts of neurons that receive messages start to recede if uh, subjected to too much stress and depression. And then there are other areas that are kind of more oriented to displeasure that get stronger, that get bigger. Uh, so uh, most likely with burnout, that's the sort of thing happening. Although the actual neuroscience behind it is not, is, is kind of in the early stages as you will. So it looks more like the depression the depression range of research, um, which is much more robust out there. Mm. And um, on your page, you talk about science versus spirituality. Yes. And okay, just just to be clear, spirituality. And we're not talking about church, but um, when when you think, because you mentioned meditation earlier, when you think about energy science and how, as we're saying try to calm the neurons down as they're firing all the time. Does that then help, does that calm, that energy help you with the, the burnout and everything? Because you, you incorporate the spiritual element and then it combines with the science in your system, so to speak. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think, um, particularly on that level, things like meditation and, and, you know, breathing exercises and calming exercises and all that, all that sort of thing. You don't even need to get too deep into spirituality. I mean, you're, you're still really in the physiology of your body mm -hmm. and you are trying to cool down the physiology of your body, switch it out of stress states. So we know that when we're stressed, we release, you know, various stress hormones Cortisone is uh, is you know kind of one of the big the big hitters, um, and uh, it, it it's it's good for certain things. It's going to help us under high stress situations, but in the end, it's it is taking its toll on on you know it changes. Like I said, even the the micro anatomy and the way the the neurons communicate and stuff. So. Uh, really, even on a physiological level, if we can switch out of high stress, if we can get out of uh, what we call our sympathetic nervous system and, and amplify our parasympathetic nervous system, which is the side of the nervous system, which is kind of saying, okay, things are pretty cool right now. We can relax. We can kind of enjoy ourselves, digest our food. We're not, we're not worried about a saber-toothed tiger biting us in the neck or anything. Um, yeah, you know, you can you can start switching your physiology, and that is going to impact our our neuroanatomy, our neurophysiology for sure. When I talk about science and spirituality, it, it probably goes you know even even further. But I'm not gonna. That's more a debate as to whether you know various different states or universes or whatever could possibly exist and. We don't even need that for this. We, we're still in the physiology range. Mm. And if I'm in a stressful situation, can I self-regulate in a sense and say, okay, yes, the outside environment is very stressful, but internally I can self-regulate and 
calm myself down despite the external influence being the opposite of that? Yeah, I I think we certainly can. I think the it's a big we that I use because uh, I'm never all that good at it, although I suppose I am uh, in certain things. Mm -hmm. um, I, like I was never a good meditator for whatever reason. I, you know, I've, I've tried all the various uh, techniques for meditation uh, and I can't say that I ever did a great job. I still, uh, I still have like a lot of mind chatter going on and, you know, <laughs> things telling me I should be doing this and I should be doing that. Um, but, you know, in reflecting on it, I guess, you know, you think about what I did uh, for decades and that is, you know, you step into the operating room, you have a brain operation to do, you, you, you realize that you could very easily kill the patient or maim them, you know, cause paralysis or inability to talk or, you know, destroy their memory or something like that. Uh, and, and I think if you aren't practicing some sort of calming influence, uh, I, I would imagine uh, that would be very hard to do. But I think we we kind of learn it maybe without even recognizing it. And I, for example, um, you know, we, would take my time at the scrub sink, for example, and just relax and not even not even fill myself with thoughts or worries, just kind of chill out. And I think that was probably a form of meditation, even though it may not be uh, by name. And then just kind of walk into the room and do my thing and then focus on the problem. Don't focus on the the bad things that could come of it. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I guess I was even doing it, but the but it's like everything else. Uh, I think the more you do it, the more you practice it, the better you be you become at it. Mm -hmm. So if if somebody is constantly subjected to a high stress situation, the more they can find ways to kind of chill the scene down, chill themselves down, even before entering it, um, uh, potentially the easier that becomes. But the first many times you almost have to say to yourself, okay, chill out, deep breathe. We talk about it even just as easy, you know, simple sometimes as just taking a deep breath or two. Mm. You know, don't, don't be holding your diaphragm, holding your body rigid. Just be able to kind of say to yourself, okay, couple deep breaths and just let everything relax. And, and you know, that's another form of meditation, I think. Mm. We call the brain gray matter. And you know how they compare two livers, a liver of someone who drinks alcohol <laughs> and a liver of someone who doesn't drink alcohol. This one is very red and, you know, it looks, you know, more, it, it looks more alive. And then the other one, the alcohol drinkers one is dry and it <laughs> changes color. If you operate on a brain and something happened, does it, does it have any color changes? Uh, well, yes and no. Um, uh, the, if you just uh, operate with everything under control, a lot of them are going to look very similar. Um, I will tell you that the, the brain uh, requires a huge amount of blood supply and a huge amount of oxygen. Um, what that means is it's what we would call very vascular. It has a lot of blood vessels. So it 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 is very easy to make bleed and it bleeds very briskly. That's one of the challenges of the surgery is you're constantly fighting bleeding. Um, because it, it just has so many blood vessels. So if you're in a car accident, for example, or somebody has ruptured an aneurysm or, or that sort of thing, the brain is, is a mess. It's very, it's a different color. It's angry. It's swollen. Uh, everything you touch bleeds. Uh, so there are definitely different states that you can find, you can find it in. Um, usually we're, you know, we, we don't see it. We're not actually seeing it when it dies because hopefully we don't see that that often in the operating room. Uh, but we do see it when it's really angry and it, I mean, there are situations, if, for example, it's in 
it's in my novel, but there are situations where it swells so much that large portions of it are coming out of the head. So yeah, it can do some pretty wild things. Wow. Earlier, you mentioned that sometimes as a doctor, and, and we've even seen this on TV, the most difficult part of your job is breaking news to the family if something happens to their loved ones. How do you communicate that? Is that training you receive from medical school or is it just a people skill you have to develop? Uh, other, you got great questions. Um, <laughs> so, Appreciate that. <laughs> uh, because you're hitting the nail on the head so many times. So one of the things that um, that is part of my job, at least, is part of you know that you see in neurosurgery. We we see a lot of tragedy. We see a lot of human tragedy, and I would argue that you know that is a principal driver of of burnout in a lot of neurosurgeons. Just you know how how you can't come through that completely unscathed just to see one horror show after another after another and literally um you know i could go in the night i could end up telling 10 15 different families that a loved one has a been killed b b has been paralyzed c is in coma i mean just just one has you know the next thing could be a a malignant brain tumor and uh, you know, not always, by thank goodness, but uh, it 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 was stunning sometimes just the sheer amount of tragedy and kind of carnage that you got exposed to, uh, which again, in and of itself, I think uh, takes its toll. Uh, but you you have to talk to these families, and and you know they are looking to you for you know, hope and guidance and all that sort of thing. Um, and so it is, it is a tough deal. Uh, it's never easy. Um, it is not trained well. Uh, certainly not a lot of time is spent on it in most medical schools. Um, we recognized it, you know, in our training program uh, for, for residents as being a real, uh, as an important deal. So we actually did address it a lot with our residents. Uh, to the point that we did a lot of role playing. We we would practice various ways of breaking bad news and and handling it with you know handling various uh, tricky scenarios with uh, various uh, different parties uh, because I think it really is again some people seem to be naturals some people less so uh, but it's something that you've you've got to build a, a uh, expertise and a a kind of a sequence of of doing it that that hopefully helps in a in a very fraught situation and a, there's an interesting twist to it um we we used to do these resilience building sessions every week and we we would talk amongst the team and i had figured well you know this breaking of bad news is one of those things that that must be really rough on all of us. And somebody made an interesting point and said, you know, yeah, it is rough. They said, but you know, sometimes I, I almost get a charge out of this. You know, I talked about the deposit, deposit versus withdrawals. It's almost a deposit. And, and I feel, you know, it's kind of weird that I, I may get some positive feelings out of doing this. And people then start shaking their head and say, yeah, you know, sometimes it does feel somehow positive when I do it. And what we recognize is that if you can do it well, you know, you may not be able to help the patient much, but if you can at least help the family in a very tough situation, in a very awful situation, try to ease their pain some, try to take away some guilt. Um, you may you may at least be doing some good. You know, it's part of what being a doctor is. It's not always mm -hmm. doing the surgery. It's not always giving the medicine. It's trying to help alleviate suffering. And there's this massive opportunity to try to help people who are suffering. So yeah, sometimes you actually get a positive feel from it uh, if you feel like you're truly helping them. Mm. When something happens, unfortunately, to your to the one you operating on do and then you break the news to the family is it easy to just let that emotion go and get ready for the next surgery because i mean you have a ton during the day right you don't just 
have one surgery, you know, because I obviously the, there's part of you that feels the loss, but then you have to be strong in front of the family and then you're done with that one. And then next case, that yeah. making that transition to the next, because now you must be fully present for this next brain in front of you. Yeah, I mean, what a great, again, you are just, you are just on target. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> uh, it's fantastic. Um, because uh, these are all subjects that that are really interesting to me and they mean a lot. Um, I personally, it was interesting. I, again, you would have these nights, you would have, it would always seem to be at night, by the way. It just seems to be, you know, in the middle of the night when all the awful stuff starts crashing in. But um, you would have these times where, you know, you would just go from one disaster to another. Um, and I have to say that most of the time, it didn't hit me hard. It didn't, I didn't feel this oh, desperate sense of humanity and feel like I had to cry or grieve or something like that. And part of it is exactly what you're saying is, you know, you got to, you got to gear up and get into the next situation. You don't have mm. the luxury of doing that, but it, a, a weird thing happened when I stopped operating. Um, I stopped, I started noticing that um, th the simplest of things would start making me cry. Now, I never cried at work, I don't think ever. And here I'm watching some silly movie and I'm feeling <laughs> tears running down my face. And what I realized is, I, I mean, I guarantee that that was all getting suppressed and bottled up. Uh, because because of exactly what you said, I can't break down. I have to mm. go move on to the next case, the next problem. Uh, but it's in and and what it's telling me is it's in there. It's not like it went away. It's not like you deflected it and it's gone. It's all logged in there, and now it's finding a way out. And I kind of joke, uh, but it may even be true. You know, I see a sentimental cat food commercial and there i am <laughs> crying all that stuff of emotion just gets released yeah yeah um one of the so you wrote three books one of them is the thriving physician what would you tell your virginia tech uh, students what does it take to thrive especially based on the topics we've covered today yeah, it's uh, well, you have to read the book and it's got all these suggestions and ways to think of it. But um, and and that's an important message, I think, is that what's happening in uh, the burnout and resilience world, it got very popular in medicine and it is across all industries right now. But it, it also gets cynical where, you know, places think, OK, I'll bring in I'll bring in somebody like Simmons and he can talk about it for 45 minutes and that's it. Everybody's cured. Everybody's going to be well and resilient uh, or we'll bring I know places that'll bring in puppies, you know, and people pet the puppies and feel good for a little while. And and that's supposed to do it, too. And one of the one of the biggest points we make is this is not something that you're going to have an epiphany on and all of a sudden you're great. Uh, it's something that you're going to have to remind yourself with frequency uh, and that th various tricks are going to work. Tricks is the wrong word, but but strategies are going to work for Peter and not work for Paul. In mm. other words, you know, you, you you're going to have to cycle through things to see what what makes those energy deposits within you and what really works for you as opposed to what may work for somebody else. So you don't want to just have somebody get up there and say, you must pet five puppies a month uh, to, to uh, never be burned out because it, that may work for somebody, but it may not for somebody else. Or like me, you know, you must sit there for 15 minutes every day and notice the air passing your nostrils as you meditate. And I'm like, I never noticed that. I can't figure <laughs> that one out. So we say that it's really important to try different methods, see what sticks, but we always begin with the same thing. And the first step is always what we call self-compassion or building your own personal emotional intelligence. And that is 
um, we're so used to in all our jobs and all our lives, you know, it's not just on the job, it's at home with the kids or the spouse or, you know, the dog or whatever. You're always focusing your energies and your attention on everybody else to the point that if you start thinking about yourself, sometimes you even feel guilty and you're just like, oh, I shouldn't be caring for myself. I should be caring for everybody else. But the first step really is to periodically think about yourself, spend a little time. Wh where am I? Am I good? Am I feeling good? Am I feeling run down? Am I feeling happy, sad? What makes me happy, sad? What brings me joy? What brings me pleasure? What is dragging me down? What are the things in the day that I dread? What are the things that I look forward to? Um, and, you know, how, I, how am I on the overall scale? And we, we believe you have to grant yourself permission to do that without guilt, to, to get a handle on where you are and what you need. And then the next step is to grant yourself permission to do it, to right. do the things that Even you Even more important, yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, it, you don't have to become a raging narcissist where that's all you do, but you have to periodically take into account, uh, you know, what you need and where you are and what, what you could be doing for yourself. And then I'll, I'll just give, you know, so we have literally 50, 60, 70 different types of strategies that you could try and just see but one of the big hitters that I, I, I'll give you two quick big hitters and I'll shut up. Um, oh, uh, one is um, uh, one is the idea of harvesting uplifts. Um, and I know in medicine uh, for sure, but I, I guarantee it occurs everywhere else that we spend much of our day looking for what could go wrong, anticipating what could go wrong because we want to head it off at the pass or we're just kind of, or we assume something's going to go wrong. You're just like waiting for the boot to drop. Um, but we, we've trained to talk about what we were talking about at the beginning, where we kind of train our brains in different ways. Well, we've all trained our brains to look for bad things. Um, and again, yeah. it's very true in medicine because you're always on the search for something terrible. Um, but what that means is we've stopped noticing good things. Mm. And what we talk about is forcing ourselves every day for a few weeks, two to three weeks, to write down maybe four, five, six good things that happen during the day. It could just be somebody smiled at us. It could be, you know, somebody thanked us for something. It could be that you heard a, a, a song that you hadn't heard since high school and it put a smile on your face. Or, But write them down, these uplifts that you hit today. Bring them home that evening, hopefully just before you go to sleep even. Read through them and say, you know, kind of cool things happened today. This happened, this happened, this happened. And there's good psychological evidence that uh, you do this for a couple of weeks or so and your brain will start seeking it out itself. You no longer have to remind yourself. Mm. Your brain will just start noticing highlights during the day, which is going to make you feel better. So that's a big one. Uh, another big one, and I'll again, I'll just give you this next one, um, is is something that we all do, particularly as we get into our 30s and 40s, is we start cutting off our relationships with a lot of people who we care about, people that you know have been important in our lives, who we enjoy, who bring us joy, who bring us you know fascination and interest. But you can just you can plot it on a graph for almost everybody, and you just see the amount and and the the number of people you stay connected with and the amount that you connect with them, you can watch those deteriorate. Um, and uh, this correlates very strongly with your uh, with your propensity to burn out. It actually also correlates uh, with dementia eventually as you get older. Uh, you know, the more you isolate yourself, uh, the more likely you will end up with uh, dementia later on. Um, and so uh, it's really important to think about the people that you care about and to make an effort periodically to stay connected. It doesn't have to be spend 10 hours a week with them, but to, to you know, I have some of my best friends from 
from med school, I'll see you every six years. And that's just not right. You know, we, we should, we should do better than that. Um, mm. And it would be healthy for us if we did. So staying, keeping your brain active with connection, relationships, learning new things, being curious will then reduce the uh, dementia possibilities. Yeah, it's not like obviously that. not going to make you completely immune, but it is, you know, those who stay very active uh, intellectually, but also um, uh, behaviorally, meaning, you know, with uh, relationships uh, have, you know, if you look at it across big populations, less risk of dementia. So, mm. uh, so it works both on the burnout level, but, you know, eventually, you know, on, on keeping your brain as fresh and, and healthy as it can be. Right. Dr. Simmons, is there something I didn't ask you that you were hoping to share with our listeners today? Oh my gosh, no, you've like emptied my uh, my brain <laughs> of everything I ever know. I got to go study some new stuff. Oh so. my <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's all, I mean, again, you're, 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 you're hitting on some of the stuff I, I deeply care about and, you know, want to get the message out. And again, uh, I think in that burnout sphere, um, that idea of don't think that you can, you know, re read a poem and that's all, it's all done or, or look at, you know, go to one lecture. I think it's really important to figure out how you're going to remind yourself to take care of yourself. Um, and, you know, again, in books like ours, we give, a, you know, we give all these suggestions. You can go online and, you know, to a million burnout sites and they'll give very similar suggestions and, and whatever it takes, you know, I'm, I'm old school, so I don't use my phone for these sort of things. But, you know, if you if you put a post-it note up on your mirror that just says, you know, smile when you talk on the telephone, it's amazing what that can do. Uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, to kind of approach it that way, realize it's something that you got to hit with frequency uh, and and keep looking for the things that work best for you. Right. Words of wisdom from Dr. Gary Simmons, the neurosurgeon and professor at Virginia Tech. This has been very educational. Thank you so much for being on our show today. Oh, it's truly my delight. I mean, you, you, this is excellent. Thank you so much. My absolute pleasure. And before you go, where can we find you on the web? Um, I do have my own website. It's basically uh, my name.com. So it's Gary, G A R Y R. Uh, uh, you spelt like Simons. So it's S I M O N D S. So Gary R. Simons.com. And it's easy to find. Oh, it's Simons. I've been saying Simons. I'm sorry about that. No, it is Simons. It, it oh. is Simons. But when people ask me, you know, how do I spell it? I say, spell it like Simons. Okay. Because uh, otherwise they want to spell S-I-M-M-O-N-S -M or something like that. But it, it's, it's Simons. Yeah, it's double M. That's right. So I will put that on the show notes. Thank you so much, Dr. Gary. Oh my goodness. It is my delight. Excellent stuff. My pleasure as well. Don't forget to subscribe, leave a rating and a review on Apple and Spotify and stay tuned for more episodes to come.